Hi everyone, welcome to week seven of American Empire. This week, uh, challenging the Cold War, we're looking at more of the entrenchment of the Cold War idea, uh, a construction, as I've referred to before. Um, and we're gonna look at challengers to that as well, obviously, as the title indicates. So we'll be looking a little bit more at this theme of, it'll carry over from last time, a bit more of this theme of Im, um, imperial anti-communism, thinking about how anti-communism informs U.S. empire after World War II, and thinking about it that way as an alternative way um, to thinking simply in, in straightforward Cold War terms as well. Um, and that also will connect to some of the reading that we did last week, um, Naoko Shibusawa's piece on um, homophobia and U.S. imperialism will kind of resonate, I think, with some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about in lecture this time as well. So three parts, as always. I'm gonna to continue to march through that series of events that really entrenches the Cold War idea over time, leading up to, as I said before, uh, 1961 and the construction of the Berlin Wall being, you know, again, that, that very concrete symbol um, of the Cold War order and something that, that, uh, supported the idea that the Cold War was there to stay and that the Cold War was simply reality and not and not necessarily an idea that was by that point being being challenged so much any longer as as a way of thinking about geopolitics on the part of uh, of Cold Warriors and and their critics. Um, then from there, I will look a little bit at Cold War culture, just say a few remarks about that, because as we know, the cultural component to geopolitics and economics and everything else we talk about is is always there. And these ideas of, you know, US empire, race, class, and gender are being worked through in, um, in, in cultural expression. So I'll say a little bit about that. And then I'll turn to some of the Cold War critics themselves to remind us that there were challenges, challengers to the Cold War idea um, and challengers to US foreign policy within the Cold War as well, challengers to imperial anti-communism. So let me, um, it's, I've left it late in the day, so let me get out there and, uh, oh yeah, today's walk. Um, I was thinking I would head towards the Five Ways uh, train station, and then from there turn on the canal, the canal that I could go towards campus, but I'll go the other way back towards the mailbox and kind of loop back around uh, and back home from there. So um, I'll see you momentarily outside. Okay, hi everyone. Back again at the corner of Reservoir and Monument Road. I've been here before. Um, heading through the park here as I head down towards Five Ways. And look, they've given us a nice new entrance gate to the Chamberlain Gardens here. Thank you, Birmingham City Council. Um, okay, so um, as I said before, I'm going to continue walking through a series of events that further entrench the logic of the Cold War. I began um, that last time through kind of the late 1940s and picking that up with the 1950s here and really um, no better place to start than National Security Council um, report number 68, NSC 68 as it's called. Historians of Cold War um, U.S. foreign policy refer to this document a lot. It's an important one. This is what it does. It establishes a kind of template for U.S. foreign policy for thinking about U.S. foreign relations uh, after, um, after World War II. So it's really, um, it's, a, it's a crucial document for that, for that purpose. So it's um, a group of people headed by Paul Nitze, um, who was the director for public uh, planning for the State Department and under the direction of the Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, put together this report. And it was essentially an outline of official U.S. thinking about uh, relations with the Soviet Union. Um, and in many ways it mirrored, I mentioned before, the, um, the kind of two camps position that Andrei Zdanov and the Soviet Union put forward before. And in many ways, NSC 68 is kind of the mirror image of that, again, with the United States being the benevolent power, the Soviet Union being the, um, the undemocratic one. And, um, and the language, it also builds on uh, the, um, it builds on the long telegram of, of George Kennan, which I also mentioned before with its sort of anti-Soviet position. 
The difference between the long telegram and NSC 68 is that NSC 68 is starker in its language. It's, it's more vociferously um, anti-communist. The long telegram is anti-communist too, but this is even more so. This is again this, this idea of imperial anti-communism, a kind of um, you know, anti-communist sentiment that's at the center and that's very intense in terms of, um, of U.S. views towards the Soviet Union. So what you have in NSC 68 then is a kind of language around um, slavery under the grim oligarchy of the Kremlin, just sort of like caricatured language essentially um, about the, uh, the totalitarian nature of, of Soviet communism. And, um, and so this um, document proposes, you know, it, it doesn't just describe the Soviet Union, it also is about what the U.S. should do in the face of this threat. And the, the sort of main idea being put forward is, you know, uh, a kind of um, always being on guard and, I guess more pragmatically, engaging in military buildup to, to match and meet and prepare for this, uh, this great threat. Also in 1950, um, the Korean War begins. North Korea invades South Korea. The, um, uh, the country became divided at the end of World War II because the march of Soviet troops um, you know, got halfway down the, the Korean Peninsula and then allies of the United States were in the southern part of the peninsula. The two, the two countries um, come together. Uh, well, they don't come together. The two countries are formed. The two countries come apart, I guess we would say at the end of the, of the war. Um, and in June of 1950, North Korean troops with Soviet um, support and approval invade the South to try to reunite. Obviously both sides, North and South, would like to see the country united under their, um, their government. And so here there's a bid on the part of the North to, to pull the country together under the leadership of uh, Pyongyang. So, um, so, um, obviously, the Truman administration is not happy about this. And um, after the um, North Korean troops cross, it's the 38th parallel that, that divides North and South. Once the, those troops cross the border um, and they're, they're winning victory, they're, they're gaining territory as they go, uh, the World War II hero, who I mentioned before, Douglas MacArthur, um, who famously returned to the Philippines in 1944, he leads uh, a UN, essentially US, um, force to, um, he, la he lands, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a smart general, he lands um, at Incheon, farther up the, the peninsula, and is able to cut off, uh, cut the supply lines off of the overextended North Korean lines, which have extended almost all the way down um, to across the um, across the the southern part of the of the Korean Peninsula. So then the battle, the the war, the direction of the war changes, and then the U.S.-led troops are moving north. They get all the way to the to the border. They get all the way now all the way up through North Korea to the border with China at the Yalu River. And here, the People's Republic of China becomes directly involved. Their armies enter the fray. And, uh, and then the, the forces, the communist forces then push the capitalist forces down to roughly where the war sort of began um, is where, is where it, it ends in, in 1953. And as you know, this remains a militarized um, border to this day. So our, our main sort of takeaway from the Korean War in our context here is, of course, to think about for U.S. citizens at the time and U.S. policymakers, this was a very dramatic example of the ways that the Cold War could turn hot. That, of course, real fighting, killing, and dying could be part of this ideological conflict between um, the two sides. It also saw uh, Japan plays an important role here because the U.S. forces are able to, you know, be supplied from and launch attacks from uh, Japan, which is, of course, now an important U.S. ally. So it's also an indicator of Japan's very different role in the geopolitical kind of order of things than was the case, of course, during and before World War II. So, um, 
interestingly, in 1953, the same year that the, that the Korean War ends, there's a bit of an opportunity for peace, actually, with the death of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. Um, it raised a question mark about what, obviously, Stalin had been in power since the 1920s, and his, I mean, what is there to say, murderous autocratic rule, um, the end of it with his, with his passing left a bit of an open question about what, what might happen. There also were, was actually a few indicators of real change. This is always a scary road. This Hagley Road here is a, not a fun one to cross. Let me go. Let's see if I can make it. Okay. Yes. Um, so, um, the, the death of Stalin, uh, and some of you may have seen the, the comedy film uh, about this, um, which in a humorous and satirical way sort of points at the absurdities of Stalinist uh, rule, and also gets a little bit of this at, at the sense of, you know, terrified though they all are, um, there's a possibility that Stalin's heirs are going to maybe do something different. It doesn't turn out to be substantively different necessarily, but there are actual differences. There is um, de-Stalinization, there is a thaw after Stalin dies. Um, Nikita Khrushchev ultimately becomes the, the new general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And he oversees, you know, the release of um, over a million from the, from the camps of the Gulag. So this isn't the end of Stalinism, but I mean, if you were one of those people in one of those camps who, who was released, um, that obviously made a big difference to you. And this happened on a, on a substantial scale. Um, and there was a little bit of relaxation of the, of the kind of you know, heavy autocratic nature of the, of the bureaucracy, but I emphasize within, within pretty strict limits as well. Um, so um, also in terms of foreign policy, the US counsels uh, its North Korean allies to, um, to, to push for peace against, with, with, the, with the Western powers, ultimately. So there's also a bit of a foreign policy element to this that sees um, the, the years after Stalin as having something of a different tone, maybe a possibility of uh, a greater ability for the two, the two sides to, to get along. But there also is a change in the United States, and a new president comes in, um, after the election of, I guess it would be 1952, so 53 also, um, Dwight Eisenhower, the World War II general, and very importantly, his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, um, a very conservative, you know, staunchly anti-communist figure. They're not, they're not really in much of a mood to, um, to, to change course in terms of, um, in terms of U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union um, and communism more, more broadly. So the chance for peace was not uh, realized. The 1953 also gives us a very dramatic example of that in the execution of the Rosenbergs. So Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were, well, Julius in particular was a communist, member of the Communist Party of the United States. During World War II, he almost certainly did give um, some information around nuclear weapons to uh, the uh, to, to Soviet spies. Um, this was a moment when, of course, the United States and the Soviets were on the same side against fascist Germany. But nonetheless, um, this takes place, and it's not the information that gives the Soviets the bomb. That's not. It's not. It's low-level information. But nonetheless, obviously, that's not something that you are that you are supposed to do. Um, and so, so the trial, the, what's important about the trial is less the specifics around um, what Julius Rosenberg gave over and how important this was. I don't think that these things are of the greatest consequence. Let me go this way. But rather, the atmosphere of hysteria. Again, as I mentioned with uh, Alger Hiss before, the atmosphere of hysteria in which, and in the case of the Rosenbergs, um, thinly veiled anti-Semitism in which these, these proceedings um, took place. So um, the, the judge in the case, just to give you a sense of it, this is what he said to the, um, to the, to the couple as he, was, as he was imposing the death sentence. They were sentenced to death. Um, quote, I consider your crime worse than murder. 
I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of Russians the A-bomb years before the best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000 and who knows but that millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. And, and he goes on in this, in this vein. So again, this is not um, a, a time of sort of reflection upon the U.S. role in causing, you know, tensions uh, between the two sides um, in, the, in the Cold War conflict. See, look at this street. It's interesting. They're doing a bunch of really nice stone repaving here, but it's not exactly clear for me which way to go. Let's see. I'll try going around the back here. Um, so um, so the, the couple is, uh, is sentenced, um, and they are both executed. They're electrocuted uh, at Sing Sing Prison in New York. And, you know, I think that the, that the government thought that by, by both of them being... I mean, it was pretty clear that if anybody was, was responsible here, it was Julius and not Ethel of the two Rosenbergs. But um, I think that the, that the government agencies thought that... Um, that Julius might give information, might, you know, sort of crack, I guess, as it were, knowing that his wife was also to be, to be executed. But that's not what happened, and they both ultimately are, are killed. So this is a, is a, you know, very strong example, again, of the, of the kind of hysteria of, of anti-communism that's, that's really pervaded U.S. society by this time. Back in Europe, um, by 1955, we also have the Warsaw Pact, so a hardening of, of positions um, in, the, in the communist camp as well. And you can think of the Warsaw Pact, you know, formed in 1955 as sort of the, the communist um, alternative to NATO. It's a, it's a pact, it's official name, it's officially called the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance. Um, it's... It's a pact of alliance between the, um, the Eastern Bloc, uh, People's Republics, as they were called. And of course, it's also um, a sort of way of, of organizing uh, the domination of the Soviet Union over the, the Eastern Bloc through, uh, we might say, its, its Eastern um, European communist proxies here as well. Um, okay, so... Then, in 1956, we have another one of these. So it's not, so I'm, I've been saying that this move towards an entrenchment of the Cold War idea, that the US versus the Soviets are, is the kind of geopolitical makeup of the world. Um, again, like I said, with the death of Stalin, there are moments where, um, where things might have gone a different way. And 1956 provides another one of these in which um, Nikita Khrushchev gives what's called the secret speech. It wasn't very secret, but nonetheless, it was very uh, important. What it is, is Khrushchev gives this speech that's a, that's a very thorough condemnation of Joseph Stalin. So it's a real, you know, rhetorical, at in, in rhetorical terms at least, a real turn away from, from the Stalinist um, uh, sort of thinking that, that so, uh, you know, obviously... Um, pervaded the, the Soviet system. And so, you know, there's, um, Khrushchev talks about how Stalin was, you know, like uncollegial, but also definitely that his own uh, policy and his own sort of style of leadership and his own direct orders led to the, the killings of many, many communists, um, as well as other supposed adversaries. And so it's a strong, it's a very strong criticism of his, um, of his leadership, but also kind of by implication, a strong criticism of the Stalinist system per se. So this might have been um, another moment in which things might have changed, but of course, ultimately, the, the degree of this thaw, the degree of this de-Stalinization is, is fairly limited. Um, Workers in East Germany found this out in 53 after Stalin died, and they thought this might be a moment for um, an uprising. It's cracked, it's cracked down on. 1956, Hungary uh, learns essentially the same lesson with an even larger uprising, this time led by a Hungarian leader himself, Imre Nagy, who um, sort of in keeping with the de-Stalinizing uh, tenor of the moment, declares further autonomy and um, 
proposes that Hungary may leave the, the Warsaw Pact. Um, Khrushchev uh, sends in the tanks. Naj is executed. The rebellion is, is put down. Um, and so uh, for Hungarian insurgents, then very little had changed since the days of Stalin. So if we think about the secret speech as a moment of opening, we can also think about the, um, the crackdown in Hungary as, as very much the limits of, of that. Now, this is sort of geopolitics. Um, you know, we've been talking about Korea, talking about um, Hungary here, so Asia, Europe, moving even to the extraplanetary <laughs> realm, I guess. Um, the Soviets launched successfully the Sputnik satellite in 1957, and this is another moment of escalation. It's not directly military, per se, but it scares the United States into thinking that, you know, the Soviets are ahead in the space race. So this is uh, significant in and of itself. It also has a major impact actually on higher education in the United States because the U.S. government turns to fund more uh, public universities and particularly the sciences in the, in the face of this and for the, and in terms of, um, you know, in the hopes that they will, they will catch up from this perceived position in which they are behind. Then, by the end of the decade, we have the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Now, we already know that Cuba and the United States, uh, the history of Cuba and of the United States is, is quite closely intertwined, you know, particularly from the late 19th century on. And um, the government of uh, Fulgencio Batista has been supported by the United States, and, um, and it's overthrown by Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and their and their allies um and of course it's not it's not exactly a communist revolution it sort of becomes one because the u.s reacts quite strongly to it uh, negatively um and ultimately castro moves closer and sort of mm, less ambiguously before long into the into the communist camp more more formally but we also want to think of fidel castro as a, a nationalist very much as well as a communist which connects to another issue that I'll have more to say about um, as we talk more about former, formal decolonization in this module. But in terms of U.S. foreign policy, because of the, mm, the, the kind of forcing of, ever, of all politics into the Cold War sort of schema, the uh, meaning that from the point of view of Washington, you're on the side of the U.S. or you're on the side of the Soviets, this means that nationalist leaders, um, and Castro is not the only one, are, are portrayed as communists to the degree that they're critical of the United States. So there's a conflation that happens between, um, between nationalism and communism from the perspective of Washington in terms of its, its Cold War thinking, which imperial anti-communism hugely um, sort of uh, propels. Okay, so, and of course the other thing about Cuba is um, this is now a communist country or a country that becomes communist, you know, just off the, just off the shores of, of Florida. Which brings me finally to the Berlin Wall, 1961. So, um, you know, we saw before with the Berlin blockade, it's resolved peacefully, thankfully. And, you know, there, there is a kind of stasis, but I mean, even by 1961, the kind of fundamental question of the fate of Berlin, which is in many ways the sort of where the Cold War begins, is unresolved. So, um, and so for the East, and both sides are very worried about the idea that, that the Germany, the side of Germany that's in their camp will fall into the other camp. From the Soviet point of view, if East Germany is enfolded into the West under NATO, then this, will, this is basically um, going to lead inevitably to an, in, an invasion, um, as of course had happened already, of uh, you know, maybe some kind of resurgent fascism in, in Germany against the, the Soviet Union. From the West's point of view, they're also very fearful of the idea that the you know, by now economic powerhouse of, of Western Germany will, um, will fall into the hands of the, of the communists. So, a more specific concern within East Germany is the departure of its citizens through um, the opening that is Berlin to the West. And um, this is ongoing. It's not only that they're losing people, they're also losing the more educated among their society. And by 1961, something like 20% of the population of Eastern Germany have, have left. So they decide to uh, build a wall 
Of course, this is very much with Soviet knowledge and approval, and they put it up in 1961. It's officially known as the anti-fascist protection rampart. That's maybe something we might talk about in class, why they would, why they would call it this, what that might mean from, from the perspective of their ideology, and the degree to which that was a sort of farcical name, or maybe had a little bit of legitimacy. We can, we can discuss this if you like. But in any case, the um, construction of the, of the Berlin Wall is, I think, as I've said before, uh, a very powerful and very concrete symbol of the logic of the Cold War. That, you know, it took many steps, it took many events for this idea that the Cold War was the way that the world was, was ordered after World War II to kind of set in. And the Berlin Wall really represents the, the entrenchment of, of this idea. Okay, I'm almost at the train station, so that's nice. I'll get onto the canal. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit about Cold War culture um, in the next part. So back in a minute. Okay, back again. Um, and just uh, maybe I should have waited um, until I was off the middle way to pick this up, but here I am. Might be a little noisy with the cars. So, um, okay, so Cold War culture then. Um, this, is, this is not secondary. I'll speak about this more briefly because I wanted to, to touch on all of those events and there's a lot of them and I have a bit to say about the critics too. But in between here, just a bit about culture. And don't take my brevity on the subject to be an indication of my thinking that it's less important because we've talked about this in many ways. Um, culture is the expression of the kind of geopolitics that we're talking about. It's also the place that propels these ideas, sometimes where they're contested and worked out. Um, there's, there's much to say and much to think about with the cultural dimension of, uh, of Cold War politics. So let's give that um, its due as we're, as we're thinking. <laughs> That sometimes happens when you film outside, and that's kind of fun. Um, okay, so um, so thinking here then, um, you know, about, I, I put some, some images on the slide here, thinking about affluence, U.S. affluence, and a kind of culture of this as promoted internationally as one sort of way that Cold War culture is presented. Um, products like Coca-Cola, um, the... The music of trumpet player Dizzy Gillespie, obviously the rock and roll of someone like Elvis Presley. Um, I'm just going to let some people come up here before I go down. The, um, the, the movies of Humphrey Bogart and James Dean and Ann Baxter um, are all examples of this. And there's a conventional wisdom that you're probably aware of around... Um... Hi. Not at the moment, sorry. Thank you, bye-bye. Um, there's a kind of um, conventional story around um, culture in the 1950s in the United States. And I think the key word to emphasize here in terms of the, the main narrative is conformity. Um, you know, it's an era of, of appliances, of freeways, um, of um, a kind of return to very traditional gender roles um, and and so on and of course when we emphasize and there's a lot of truth to that narrative that's that's very much the case and I'm gonna talk about that aspect of it first but um, of course the other the other sort of point that I want to make here is that an over emphasis on the narrative of conformity important though it is can lead us to overlook the degree to which there were critics even in the most um, you know, even in the summer of 1953, um, when the uh, the Rosenbergs were were executed, um, there were there were critics at that moment, as well as as later on. Um, also, you know, we sometimes think about you can think about the 1950s as a period that's kind of waiting for the 1960s in terms of those who might have uh, felt dissatisfied with the culture of conformity, and that's not necessarily the best way of looking at it because there's still a dynamic um, regardless of how dominant the culture of conformity is there's still a dynamic that has um, critics uh, at the same time okay but let me give a few examples of the uh, culture of conformity first here um, in order to give a better sense of what that is before we turn to the critics okay so 
I start with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now the FBI is not a cultural um, organization per se, but it played a huge role in the in the creation and maintenance of this anti-communist culture um, and this culture of conformity in the United States in the 1950s. So um, um, in the course of their, and this is you know largely through their uh, investigations of, of communist influence, of so-called communist influence uh, in cultural and government um, institutions within the United States. So the FBI carried out investigations. Um, they looked through people's garbage. They, um, they planted wiretaps. I mean, there were, there were some you know, long lengths that they went to to, uh, to establish and to, um, I guess, root out, but also sh always show that they were rooting out and therefore increasing the idea of the threat of communist influence um, at the time. And of course, another dimension of this that you may have heard something about, um, so we call this the Red Scare, this idea, this, this paranoid sort of sense of um, fear of communism and fear of uh, subversion within the United States. <clears throat> the Red Scare is also connected to the Lavender Scare, which you may have heard of, a homophobic purge of government employees more specifically, but also a kind of intensification of the homophobic culture of the United States in the 1950s as well. Now, you don't need me to tell you that, the, that homophobia was not new in the 1950s, but uh, we, we, we do want to think about the degree to which, um, and we've talked about this again, um, Naoko Shibusawa's article gives us a real sense of this and gives us a sense of how thinking about homophobia, the intensification of it in the 1950s, as well as the emerging challenges, also kind of shifts our view from thinking necessarily about the, the construct of the Cold War and gets us more in a mode of thinking about the construct of the model of the paradigm of US empire. Okay, so we want to think about the, um, the lavender scare in this sense. But let me pause for a minute also just you know, so importantly, to think about the impact that this had on people's lives. People who, if, so, so there are a number of communists or people who were accused of being a communist, and accused is already a loaded term because it implies that the thing is something that no one would want to be. Um, some members of the Communist Party or others who were not communists but were accused of being so, defended themselves very vigorously and very uh, unashamedly. Um, and reading the, the transcripts of, of some of the of some of the um, the court records around this is is a marvel to behold. It really it really um, shows us that not everybody was was uh, conforming in this culture of conformity. Gay and lesbian Americans who were persecuted under the, the lavender scare were perhaps less likely to to they might have left quietly um, from their position if they were, if, if such an accusation was leveled against them. And again, accused, we'll put this in quotation marks because obviously it implies something that's not true about the individuals under this supposed, well, it's a real, it really is an accusation, but the, the, the implications of the word accusation are something that I want us to, to think critically about. In any case, I just wanted to, to just sort of think about that with you for a minute, and maybe something we also might want to take up in seminar, is about the, the real costs that this had um, for, for people who were, who were subject to this particular form of, um, of persecution. Their, their jobs uh, might have been at risk. They might have lost their jobs. They might have felt that the, the, the overall culture of conformity and homophobia was too um, unforgiving to, to, to speak out within. Um, and they're also uh, gay and lesbian Americans at this time didn't have the, the kind of, you know, communists at least had the apparatus of the Communist Party and other allies and comrades, not to mention an affiliation with the Soviet Union, the, the second most powerful uh, nation in the world at this time. And for those, again, persecuted by the homophobia of the Lavender Scare, this just wasn't the case. And so we want to... Um, 
we want to give that some thought as we're thinking through this issue as well. Okay, the lavender scare, of course, wasn't the only uh, example of this culture of conformity that I'm talking about. Um, the, um, the civil defense exercises, of course, were another one. So um, in New York, every year, there were these kind of formal government-led um, exercises uh, in which the air raid sirens would go off. Everyone had to go into the into the subway or what have you. And if you didn't participate, you would be fined. You would get in serious trouble. You couldn't say this is a farce. This is a this is obviously just the the ideological um, you know. Uh, this is an ideology at work rather than necessarily a drill that's going to keep us safe if an atomic bomb lands on the city. But this wasn't really uh, an option. You needed to, to partake in these. The school system, of course, had its own version of this. This is even larger in scale. The duck and cover exercises. Um, Bert the Turtle, the cartoon, you know, encouraged children to, um, to, get, to, to get under their desks uh, when the if the if the, the 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 sound was given um if the if the bombs were were on their way and we can laugh at this and in some ways rightly so the idea that hiding under your desk would help you from an atomic bomb is of course absurd so that's not what's important here what's important is the ideological work that this did to have you know a generation of school children growing up uh in their in their primary schools fearful of the um the, the never-ending threat, the ever the ever-present threat of the of the Soviet Union, of course, was ideologically very powerful. Religion also had a role to play here. Um, this is when the 1950s is when uh, religion takes a larger role in uh, in U.S. governance. Um, the um, the words under God are added to the Pledge of Allegiance in this period. Uh, in God We Trust is stamped on the money uh, for the first time. This isn't this doesn't go back to uh, the 19th century as we may have may have imagined. Um, the president uh, begins ending speeches with the words God bless America. So there is a way that that Christianity is also um, you know doing its work here. And I mean, some of the critics of, of the culture of conformity also come from a Christian perspective. So it isn't to say that Christianity is monolithically conservative here, but it certainly does have um, a conservative uh, flavor for the, in terms of the ways that it's deployed uh, in support of the, the official culture of the, of the moment. So I mentioned movies a little bit, and there's so much, there's so many, and there's so much to say about those. Um, maybe also a topic for seminar, if people are interested in talking about the films of the 1950s, uh, I'm interested in that. Um, but, um, but also I want to call our attention to the importance of TV, which um, goes from being, um, you know, something uh, in, in only a few homes to by the end, basically the 1950s we might think about as the, the decade um, of, the, of the rise of the television. It's there at the, at the, in the 1940s, of course, but it's in um, many, many living rooms by the end of the, of the decade. Um, and so um, the, kind of, um, the kind of cultural products that were on television were often more conservative than those uh, in, in larger budget films where maybe the ideological room to maneuver was a bit greater. Um, television, you know, um, I guess with, um, well, shows like Father Knows Best, but to my mind, maybe the most sort of, um, the most sort of powerful example is Leave it to Beaver. Uh, it's the ultimate sort of um, white, suburban, um, traditional, uh, conservative, conformist uh, type of, of show also had a kind of charm that drew in audiences and was was very popular. Um, and I mean, it was very popular in the 1950s, but it, it played in reruns uh, for a long time after that too. So it had a long kind of afterlife as well. So there, again, there were challengers to this and I want to turn to that now. Um, it's kind of nice as I, this is a nice spot to, to pause for a second, um, right in the, in the center of things. So um, I'll pause for a second here um, and, and um, 
and pick up with the idea of the critics of Cold War culture uh, in just a minute. But but just to kind of again emphasize the point that um, that that Cold War culture was pervasive. It had many mm, elements. Um, it operated on on multiple levels, and it. Um, and it was very uh, influential and powerful. The 1950s were um, an era of a culture of conformity, even though, as we'll see in a minute, not everybody agreed with that. Okay, back in a moment. Okay, let's keep going. Um, what is this bridge called? The Broad Street Tunnel. I think this is the also known as the Black Sabbath Bridge, if I'm correct. This is, yeah, obviously this is going under Broad Street, so uh, many of you will know exactly where I am. Um, okay, to the critics then. So, um, I'll mention a few of them, and they're not all critical in the same way, and they're not leveling the same critiques, that's for sure, but I just want to give you a sense, uh, and they're not the dominant voices necessarily of the era, um, but I just want to give you a sense of them again to, to reinforce this idea of the, of the contestation of imperial anti-communism that is happening. Um, and also to give us a sense too of the, you know, the rebellious 1960s that we, we know something about. Um, there's, there's things going on in the 1950s that are important to think about in terms of leading up to, to what the 1960s are as well. So, um, let me start then by mentioning, uh, oh, Arthur Miller's play, 1949 play, Death of a Salesman. So this is a very popular and influential um, piece of drama. And, you know, the character Willie Loman, the, the salesman, um, he's older and the, the kind of the heartless company doesn't, doesn't have his interests in, in mind. And he's, he's, you know, very depressed, let's say. I don't want to give too much of it away as a result. Um, now, you know, there's a way that, and this is also important to think about in terms of the larger question of critics of a culture. Criticisms can be absorbed by dominant cultures, and you know, um, death of a salesman doesn't exactly lead to the to the overthrow of the culture of conformity, but nonetheless, it is a it is a you know, it it has traction and it it resonates, and you know, it obviously struck a chord with people, and it's really quite anti-capitalist when you think about it, um, that the corporate capitalism of the post-World War II, World War II era does not care about the workers who, who work for it, um, is not, that doesn't sound very conformist to me in terms of thinking about not challenging the dominant, um, the dominant kind of structures of power of the, of the age. So, um, so we can think about here um, with this play as one, one example. Um, so in terms of uh, more, I guess, kind of intellectual history here, we can think about David Reisman's The Lonely Crowd of 1950 as another example. So this was a really quite a popular, one of those sort of, um, it's, not, it's kind of academic, but it's also popular, I guess, popular academic book about um, what Reisman called American character. And what he's looking, and this is directly a study of conformity as kind of an idea. So. What Reisman is looking at is these three stages of the development of, of culture um, of Americans. So there's lots of ways that we can be critical of even this idea of American character, and that's fine, we should do that. But for our purposes, I just want to think about it as a, as a good example of uh, a work of, of criticism against the, the dominant culture. So for Reisman, there was the, um, the traditional type, the... Um, Oh, what was the second one called? I've got it here in my notes. The inner directed and then the other directed. Okay, so the traditional type is the, is the one who, who builds their identity based on generations before. The, um, the inner directed type is the, is the kind of classic uh, individual, individualist um, American character. You know, there's a, there's a connection here to kind of ideas um, of, the, of the frontier. And, um, and so this is the inner directed person who follows their own sort of initiative and directive in, in U.S. societies. The other directed, it's sometimes a little bit confusing because the inner directed should be outer directed, but it's not. It's other directed is the, is the third type. And this is the type who looks to others before making decisions, um, again, in the corporate setting, uh, in social settings. And Reisman's diagnosis is that this has become the dominant, the dominant type of 
um, American character. So again, we have, um, in, in taking on the subject of conformity in such a direct way, and in uh, positing, you know, just how, how influential it's become, we have an example here of, um, of, a, of a criticism there, therein. This isn't, this isn't, the point of the lonely crowd isn't to celebrate uh, the other directed, it's to, it's to lament its, its sort of um, ascendancy to the, um, to the, the most important mode of, of the American type, I guess. Um, in sociology, C. Wright Mills publishes his book, The Power Elite, in 1956. This is even more, this is more of a structural critique. Um, it's, not, it's not exactly Marxist, but it's pretty close. He's looking at the, the ways that, um, that elite members of U.S. society in politics um, and in economics are, they function as an elite. This is not a group of individual self-made people who through their own hard work made their way to the top, no. These are um, individuals who knew each other in, in boarding schools, um, you know, much the way in which the, the British elite is sometimes thought of, um, old boys networks and, and so on. Uh, the, the word chumocracy does not exist at this point, I don't think, but this is also the kind of thing that we're talking about. And Reisman is talking about this and how this continues, not just in that people know each other and families know each other um, among the wealthy and the powerful, but also how this um, very much shapes how, how power works through things like interlocking directorships in which, you know, people who sit on the, people who are advising the Secretary of State also sit on corporate boards, etc. And so there's a certain, um, there's a certain uniformity of perspective that comes with this. And of course, it's a perspective which is favorable to the interests of the, um, those that comprise this very elite. Okay, in terms of uh, fiction, we have the novel uh, Sloan Wilson's The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. And this was also very popular. It's made into a um, uh, film. Um, so the, how, how to describe it, I'll do it quickly. So the main character, um, he lives the suburban life. He takes the train. It's a little bit like if you've seen the TV show Mad Men, it's a little bit like that. And Mad Men obviously drew some of its inspiration um, from this, this novel. So, you know, they live in Connecticut uh, or something. Takes a, he takes a train into the city. And, um, and his life, his successful, comfortable life with a, a wife in the suburbs, family, and so on. It's, I mean, both, both of the male and female characters are, are present here, and we could read it a bit against the grain, but I also would say that the dominant reading would, would focus our attention on the main male character. Um, and so he, um, he is dissatisfied. I guess maybe one way we could put it is he's bored. Um, and part of this is because um, part of this is because his um, his success and his comfort don't lead to any kind of adventure or excitement. It's also in contrast to his experience. He's he reflects back in different ways to his experiences um, as a soldier in World War II, and knowing that that he's not going to have that that. His life is not going to be that exciting again, both in terms of the, the military sort of, you know, obvious part of it, and also, I'll leave it at this, his personal sort of connections that he makes in, in Italy as well. Um, so there's a great contrast between the excitement of World War II, you know, as, as sort of frightening as that might have been as well, with the, with the, the dissatisfactions of, of the conformist kind of setup in the modern corporation um, after the war. Okay, we have a historian to add to the mix here, William Appleman Williams. You may remember I mentioned him in the first lecture as an example of the revisionist school of U.S. foreign relations with his book, um, The Tragedy of American Diplomacy of 1959. So thinking less about that is as in terms of histori historiography here, but thinking about it more in terms of history as, a mo as an example, as a primary document um, in, this, in this moment of time, um, as another excellent example of a critique of the culture of conformity or a critique of the, the, um, I, the, the kind of um, pro-US, pro-capitalist perspective of imperial anti-communism. And as I said before, 
In that book, Williams puts forward the idea that the United States has not always been uh, a benign force in the world for, for liberty, as opposed to what other historians like Samuel Flagg Bemis had, had said before, but instead that the U.S. itself was an imperial force. Um, and to call the U.S. an empire, um, you know, it's interesting because it's our whole module, but to call the United States an empire at this time was a very subversive thing to say. And here a professional and influential historian is doing this in, in a pretty influential book as well. Um, Okay, we also have, um, in psychology, Stanley Milgram's experiments. This is into the early 60s by this point, but um, rather than describe it all, I'll say look it up. They're very interesting. The Milgram experiments would never be conducted today. They would never pass um, an ethics review, but they, they reveal a lot about, um, about the dangers of conformity and exactly where it can, where it can lead. So um, there's a major study about this that uses human subjects to dramatize the, um, the degree to which um, a white man in a lab coat and a clipboard will be listened to um, for essentially no good reason in the, in the course of these, um, these experiments. Okay, so another example there. And of course, the beat poets and authors, um, Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, um, they were obviously not representative of the culture of conformity of the 1950s. They rejected heteronormativity, the suburbs, um, and the... I mean, there's definitely ways in which we would think about their, their whiteness um, and their individualism in some ways as also conforming. Again, this is always important to remember with criticism. Rare is the thing, um, a criticism that escapes all all aspects of the power dynamics that it that it wishes to to critique and the beats are a great example of this we can see their criticisms we can certainly see them um, and you know they're much celebrated we can also see the limitations of them um, I mean if you look at the just read on the road and you can see both of these things uh, very much at work and we can read on the road through an imperial lens, thinking about the U.S. and Mexico, for example, and attitudes um, about Mexico on the part of, of a critic uh, like Kerouac in the U.S. Um, as, uh, as, a, as a way to think through this idea of the limitations of, of critique. Um, but nonetheless, they are, they are, they are there. Um, there are also Marxists, I've got a bit of that on the slides as well, um, actual Marxists that are, um, I mean, it's kind of funny to say that, but, uh, but it's true. Um, and this was, of course, you know, a really, um, a very subversive kind of position to, to take. This is not the dominant culture. This is marginal, um, relatively speaking, but also influential in its own way and helps prepare the ground for the 1960s while also leveling important critiques in its moment. This is the other thing. Just sort of noticing um, the roots of countercultural critique in the 1950s is also not just to, just to position these as important because of what comes later. They're important at the time, too. Um, and they give sustenance to, to thinkers uh, and activists who are, who are critical of, um, of US foreign policy and of capitalism at this time. So um, magazines like the National Guardian, um, I, um, Marxist and communist, the Communist Party itself continues to function. It's obviously, you know, besieged but it, it still uh, continues to, to be there. And it publishes, um, well, we read uh, Political Affairs. We read Claudia Jones writing in Political Affairs in the 1950s. This is a great example of, of what I'm talking about here. So the, um, the left critique of capitalism and of imperialism, these leftist publications that I'm talking about here, like Political Affairs, The National Guardian, Monthly Review, they're all about imperialism. They're talking about imperialism and U.S. imperialism, the relationship between capitalism and, and imperialism in every issue. Okay, beyond that, we have social movements. And they might not be as, as their influence might not be as large, especially in the early 1950s as they become by the end and into the 1960s. But labor feminism, again, feminist activists who often work through 
uh, the trade union movement are are part of what's shaping U.S. culture and contesting the kind of ideas of conformity. You know, this follows from the expectations that were raised for women who worked in factories during World War II, um, who were not satisfied to to go uh, to return to or join suburban homes uh, after the after the war was over. So, so this is an example here. We also have what was called homophile, um, meaning to love the same. We have queer activists in the 1950s um, as well. I said before that those persecuted by the Lavender Scare would have, would have you know, found their situation a very difficult one. This is true. It's also true that groups like the Mattachine um, Society and the Daughters of Belitis, an early lesbian organization, formed, existed, and had you know, a circle around them of people who were... Um, who were um, I mean making community just as queer subjects was its own form of resistance and um, and so um, this is part of what we're what we're talking about here as well as well as obviously you know um, early expressions of pride and resistance against um, against homophobia happening through organizations like this at the time as well. Okay, the path's a little narrow and some people are coming. I'm just going to step over to the side. Uh, while I more or less bring this to, to a close. So one of the most fundamental... Um, looking around while I do this. One of the most fundamental um, kind of challenges, of course, to the culture of conformity and to the, um, the idea of imperial anti-communism that I'm talking about is, of course, the black liberation struggle. Um, and, um, and, you know, we can think of the 1940s through to the 1960s as we might call it the age of the civil rights movement and, and others have indeed called it this. Um, so we know that, um, well, I mean, you can look in many ways at the ways that race ties many of the elements of, of imperial anti-communism together um, in that, um, you know, white supremacy, overt segregationist, and also in its in its liberal and sometimes somewhat more subtle forms, pervade much of this discourse. To challenge white supremacy, to put it one way, was often to be uh, called a communist at this time. Martin Luther King himself, um, a great example of something I mentioned before, a Christian critic of the, the, the order of the day, was frequently called a communist by his, um, by his opponents. So, you know, from, from Dr. King to Rosa Parks to Malcolm X, we have many examples, obviously. There's so, this is such a huge topic. I'm just, I'm just touching on it, not really getting into it at all. Um, but I want, to, I want to point out that it is, it is perhaps the most fundamental challenge to, um, to this culture that I've been, the dominant culture that I've been describing at this time. I mean, what is more important? Oh, look at this view. Really nice sky up there. It probably looks very far away in the camera, but very nice. Okay, so um, so there are also different strains. I just want to say one last thing about this is that there are different strains within uh, the Black Freedom Movement. Some are more Marxist in orientation or inspiration. Others more Christian. Some, um, you know, want to challenge the United States. Others want the United States to improve within its own sort of um, political terms of order, and so on. I put up a slide on a group that was called the Southern Negro Youth Congress, the SNYC. They're also sometimes referred to as the First SNCC, a student organization, a youth organization. Um, they're certainly not just students who um, in many ways kind of anticipate a lot of the politics that, that come in the, in, the 19, um, in the 1960s. And they're active in the 1930s through to the end of the 1940s. So they're early. Um, but they have an anti-imperialist stance. They have a criticism of, um, of capitalism as, to their minds, you know, part of the, of the imperialist um, and capitalist order. So, so race and class in particular, um, working through the analysis with a group like the SNYC. And, of course, one of the great, um, I mean, a number of important and influential people come out of this group, but obviously the one, for our purposes, that I want to leave us with is Jack O'Dell, um, who uh, you, you watch a film about this week, and so you have, uh, and, and read a bit about too, so you have a bit of a sense of, of who he is. But he, um, 
you know, again, I've been talking about a number of examples, but I would, I would put him forward as one of the great examples of a critic of, uh, of imperial anti-communism and of the culture of conformity of the US in the 1950s. Okay, and of course, we'll talk about him in class. So let me leave it there, um, which is just as well, it's getting dark. Um, and uh, nice talking to you as always. Uh, thanks for coming with me on this walk, and I look forward to seeing you all in seminar. Bye.